Now you could say that ethics is essentially about how we negotiate our own and other people's vulnerabilities. The sort of behavior we recognize as unethical is very frequently something to do with the misuse of power and the range of wrong or corrupt responses to power. It's to do with the ways in which fear or envy or admiration can skew our perception of what a situation truly demands of us. So that instead of estimating what it is that we owe to truth or to reality or to God as the source of truth, we calculate what we need to do so as to acquire, retain, or at best, placate power. And there is, of course, a style of supposedly religious morality that works in just such an unethical way. But when we begin to think seriously about ethics, about how our life is to reflect truth, we do not consider what is owed to power Indeed, we consider what is owed to weakness, to powerlessness. Our ethical seriousness is tested by how we behave towards those whose goodwill or influence is of no use to us. Hence the frequently repeated claim that the moral depth of a society can be assessed by how it treats its children, or, one might add, its disabled, its elderly, or it's terminally ill. Ethical behavior is behavior that respects what is at risk in the life of another and works on behalf of the other's need. To be an ethical agent is thus to be aware of human frailty, material and mental, and so by extension it is to be aware of your own frailty. And for a specifically Christian ethic, the duty of care for the neighbor as for oneself is bound up with the injunction to forgive as one hopes to be forgiven. Basic to this whole perspective is the recognition both that I may fail or be wounded and that I may be guilty of error and damage to another. It's a bit of a paradox, then, to realize that aspects of capitalism are, in their origin, very profoundly ethical, in the sense I've just outlined. The venture capitalism of the early modern period expressed something of the sense of risk by limiting liability and sharing profit. It sought to give limited but real security in a situation of risk, and it assumed that sharing risk was a basis for sharing wealth. It acknowledged the lack of ultimate human control in a world of complex processes and unpredictable agents, and attempted to negotiate vulnerabilities, in the language I used a moment ago, by stressing the importance of maintaining trust and offering some protection against unlimited loss. By sharing risk between investor and venturer, it also shared power. The problems begin to arise when the system offers such a level of protection from insecurity that risk comes to be seen as exceptional and unacceptable. We take for granted a high level of guaranteed return, and so we come to prefer those transactions in which the actual business of time-taking and the limits involved in material labor and scarcity of goods are less involved. It's been persuasively argued that things begin to go astray morally in the early and intimate association between capitalism and various colonial projects, in which abundant new natural resources and abundant new reserves of labor, notably in the shape of slavery, could be counted on to minimize some kinds of risk. But in the post-colonial climate, it has been the world of financial products that becomes the favored basis for both personal and social economy. A 
badly or inadequately regulated market is one in which no one is properly monitoring the scarcity of credit. And this absence of monitoring is especially attractive when governments depend for their electability on a steady expansion of spending power for their citizens. Increasingly, to pick up the central theme of Philip Bobbitt's magisterial works on modern global and military politics, increasingly, government rests its legitimacy on its capacity to satisfy consumer demands and to maximize choices. Its capacity to defer or to obscure that element of the uncontrollable, which in earlier phases of capitalist production dictated the habits of mutual trust and shared jeopardy, the habits that made sense of the otherwise morally controversial idea that the use of money was itself in some sense a chargeable commodity, something that needed to be paid for. Maximized choice is a form of maximized control. But it presupposes and encourages a basic model of the ideal human agent as an isolated subject confronting a range of options, each of which they are equally free to adopt for their own self-defined purposes. So if an economy resting on financial services rather than material production offers more choice, a government will lean in this direction for electoral advantage, since its claim to be taken seriously is now grounded in its ability to enlarge the market in which individuals operate to purchase the raw materials for constructing their identities and projects. As I hope will be clear, this is a deeper matter than just greed. It's a fairly comprehensive picture of what sort of things human beings are. And to recognize it as a reasonably accurate model of late modern developed society, especially in the North Atlantic world, is not to suggest any blanket condemnation of market principles, any nostalgia for pre-modern social sanctions and so forth, only to begin to sketch an analysis of where and how certain quite intractable problems arise. As already indicated, the modern market state, in Philip Bobbitt's sense of the term, the state that promises maximized choice and minimal risk, is in serious danger of encouraging people to forget two fundamentals of economic reality. Scarcity, as an inexorable truth about a materially limited world, and concrete productivity and added value as the condition for increasing purchasing power or liberty and thus for sustaining any kind of market. The tension between these two things is of course at the heart of economic theory. An imbalance in economic reality arises when one or the other dominates for too long, producing an unhealthily controlled economy, scarcity driven, or an unhealthily hyperactive and ill-regulated re regulated economy based on the simple expansion of purchasing power. But forget that tension, and what happens is not stability, but plain confusion and fantasy. 